is a particularly bold crime. It was the perfect heist. No fingerprints, no eyewitnesses, nothing. This is a story to show that pride goes before a fall. The more they know, the less they know. We're still sitting pretty. They think they're not going to get caught, and in the back of my mind, I know we've got you. Tim Ring was greatly surprised. Don't move. You're under arrest. van was running. That's what the man at the church had said. An armored white van with its motor running, abandoned in the parking lot. Police, when they arrived, could see a body in the front seat. They feared the worst. Eleven hours earlier, 8 a.m., November 28th, 1994. Phoenix, Arizona. Wells Fargo driver John Magash and his messenger started their daily rounds. In an unmarked armored van, they went from business to business, picking up the cash that was brought in each day to deliver it to the bank. On the radio at headquarters was John Magash's friend, Harold Hart. He says nothing about that morning seemed out of the ordinary. Magash was in his usual humor. He always done this Humphrey Bogart thing. My last name's Hart. Call him on the radio. I'd call him, hey, John, what are you doing? He'd say, I'm just sitting here, sweetheart. Then, around 1.30 p.m., the armored van pulled up to the Arrowhead Mall in suburban Glendale. By this time, it was carrying over half a million dollars. It stopped in front of Dillard's department store. The messenger exited the van and went inside. He made his pickup, then came back five minutes later to... Nothing. The van, the money, and the driver were gone. Five hours later, the van was finally located. Police had to wait for a Wells Fargo representative to arrive because the van's alarm was still activated. When the door was opened, inside was the dead body of the missing driver, John Magash. Mr. Magash had a gunshot wound to the uh, temple. He was lying down on the floorboard, completely dressed in his uh, security uniform. What was most personal to me was just how cold-blooded and senseless it was. You can take down an armored car, you can... You can give money from someone and not have to kill him. The back of the van was empty, save for some rolled coins and reports. The half a million dollars had been stolen. From the beginning, police knew they were dealing with sophisticated criminals who had foiled a tried and true security system. At companies like Wells Fargo, vans are armor plated, the glass bullet resistant, they employ a buddy system that is difficult to beat. The messenger, or hopper, makes all deliveries and pickups. The driver stays with the van at all times. Both messenger and driver carry 38 caliber pistols. If the doors are forced open, an alarm sounds. In this case, however, all of those security measures had failed. To find the culprits, investigators started with the two Wells Fargo employees. My first thought, as most of our first thoughts were, is perhaps the driver or perhaps the messenger might be involved because many times in armored car robberies, there is an insider involved in the planning or the execution of the robbery. However, that idea was quickly dismissed. Investigator Bruce Lowe had questioned the messenger right after the van went missing. He was big, doe-eyed, uh, frightened kind of uh, befuddled, if you will, and it was hard to uh, uh, create anything to say that he was involved in this. As for the murdered driver, John Magash, if he had been involved, he had been double-crossed. 
But Lowe learned Magash had a clean record at Wells Fargo. He also had a habit that might just explain what had happened. It was a normal thing for Mr. Magash to smoke, and he wasn't actually supposed to be doing that because he had to open the door to do that. Sometimes he would step out, but most of the time he would sit in the van and actually smoke uh, the, the cigarette inside the van, just blowing it out the door. This breach of security explained how a robber could gain entry to the armored van without setting off the alarm. The robbers seemed to have made a clean getaway. They were smart enough to have known the habits of the driver and had left few clues behind. Police had scoured the mall, and all they found were the shattered glasses of John Magash. The perpetrators had left no fingerprints in the van, and the ballistic evidence turned out to be of little use. There was very little recovered as far as a bullet. We found out that was because a frangible bullet was used, which is a bullet that will break up whenever it uh, is shot and makes entry into uh, whatever it hits. The likelihood of solving any crime drops as the hours go by. For the heist, police had no leads after 24 hours, and the pressure was on. A lot of people wanted this to be solved. You don't get a whole lot of, uh, of armored cars that uh, get taken down, especially where the driver is murdered. The mysterious case was left to lead detective Tom Clayton, a 12-year veteran of the Glendale Police Department. With so little to go on, Clayton sent out alerts to see if the public could offer any help. Police fielded a few calls from people who reported seeing a white man leaving the mall. One call we received was from a gentleman in Sun City. He noted a white van driving down the road at a high rate of speed. It was being followed very closely by a red truck, and it, it ran a stop sign. The witness recalled that the truck was driven by a dark-haired white male in his 20s or 30s, but he could not remember the make of the vehicle. Investigators who were grasping at straws tried to jog the witness's memory with photos of red pickups. But he couldn't narrow it down any further. Authorities couldn't find the truck, and the investigation ground to a halt. Then, a month later in December, police received the tip they'd been looking for. An informant told police about a woman who might have information regarding the crime. Detectives Clayton and Lowe tracked down the woman and questioned her. In her first interview, she told us about a boyfriend named James Greenham, who had been living with her, that had made a comment one time about, uh, what would you do if I robbed an armored car? The man, it turned out, sometimes worked as a bouncer. But James Greenham was usually broke until his ex-girlfriend said about a month ago when something had changed. Sometime after the armored car robbery, she described Mr. Greenham coming up with uh, quite a bit of cash and paying, paying bills and, and having money to spend. The ex-girlfriend told the investigators that Greenham had a friend named Tim Ring. Ring was also a bounty hunter, and she believed he too could have been involved in the heist. This was the break Detective Clayton desperately needed. He now had two prime suspects, but the men would not be easy to catch. FBI Special Agent Ron Myers says that as members of the sometimes shadowy world of bounty hunters, the two suspects had an edge. They knew a lot of things that we would do, a lot of investigative techniques we would use, and we had to be cautious that they didn't catch us using them. And so an elaborate cat and mouse game began, one that would soon grow to include 70 investigators working around the clock, all trying to get back a missing half million dollars and get justice for a murdered driver. Just outside Phoenix, Arizona, November 1994. An armored Wells Fargo van is robbed of over half a million dollars in broad daylight, and its driver is murdered. A month later, police had honed in on two suspects, local bounty hunters Timothy Ring and James Greenham. The brutal crime and the daring heist demanded that the authorities give the case top priority. 
on a scale of one to ten, as far as the complexity of this investigation, I would give it somewhere probably around a nine and a half. It involved just about everything that the FBI and the police do when it comes to conducting investigations. Glendale Police and the FBI set up an armored car task force, which began a 24-hour surveillance. This meant nights watching Tim Ring's house. Mundane trips following the men around town. Hour after hour of waiting for something to happen. We wanted to see where they were going, who they were contacting, and what they were doing in the hopes that we might be led to other suspects. Within a few weeks, police had discovered what they believed was a third accomplice, a 43-year-old former Phoenix area policeman named Bill Ferguson. The surveillance yielded at least two other noteworthy facts. First, that Tim Ring owned a red pickup truck, the same color truck that witnesses said had been involved in the crime. Second, all three suspects seemed to be flush with cash. In the first couple of weeks of surveillance, we learned they were spending a lot of money with no really visible source of income. Armed with the evidence, police convinced a judge there was probable cause to get wiretaps on the suspect's phones. They immediately began picking up what sounded like incriminating conversations. In this one... Yes, these were sports cars. Made two months after the heist, Timothy Ring and Bill Ferguson talked about buying expensive cars and worried about how it would look. Yeah, the only problem with BMWs is they draw a lot of attention. See, nobody thinks about anything if you buy a Pontiac. Oh, I was thinking about that, too. You know, all of a sudden, a BMW's parked in your driveway, I guarantee you, you're going to be in trouble. I'm tempted to go get myself a Z anyways. <laughs> I really am. I'm very, very, very tempted. Well, I think you should wait. No. Oh, no, sh... Well, I'm just, just checking. Jesus. Later in the same conversation... Ring says he is frustrated with the third suspect, James Greenham. Yeah, he was doing so good, too, but not anymore. I'm cutting him off. Well, that'll fuck up one of our plans. What's that? What was they going to fuck up up north? I don't mean getting rid of him. Oh, just cutting him off as far as supplying him with what he needs to be that way. So you don't understand, I hold both his and mine. Mmm, I have it. He doesn't. Mmm. After more surveillance and listening to more conversations, investigators felt like they were getting to know their three suspects. The clear leader of the group was 30-year-old bounty hunter Timothy Ring. He was an expert marksman, a former prison guard, and had even done some informant work for the FBI. The conversations revealed Ring to be macho. A lot of things, but you'll never get a woman to stop acting like a woman. Violent. Listen, Goofy, I hope that you're having a good f***ing time, because when you get back, I'm going to kick your f***ing ass. And very much in control. I just want to f***ing strangle this out of him. In fact, I think I will. Listening to the conversations, it was clear that Tim was the ringleader of this group of people. Um... It was clear that everybody was following his lead and was doing what he wanted them to do. You could see Ring capsulized and kept Ferguson and Greenham separate from each other to some extent and was very cool about what was going on. Investigators thought that Bill Ferguson, an ex-cop with a spotty record, seemed the least involved. He spent much of his time at local strip clubs. Bill Ferguson was spending a lot of money on topless dancers. Bill Ferguson liked to hang out in uh, one particular uh, topless uh, dance bar. He had a couple of girls that he was lavishing thousands of dollars on. Ferguson had even arranged for a photo shoot at a local airstrip. He had these girls in the parking lot with his new Camaro posing in various forms of undress in the parking lot. And he was taking their picture while our surveillance team was in the airport tower taking his picture. Then there was the excitable, perpetually broke James Greenham nicknamed Yoda, because his buddies thought that's what he looked like. Investigators thought if any of the men were going to break, it would be him. It became real apparent Greenham was a weak link in, in what was going on because Ring would go out and do his shopping for him. At one point, Ring bought him underwear. 
With that in mind, police set out to make Greenham nervous. First, they posted composite sketches of three suspects near Greenham's apartment. Investigators actually had this one drawn to look exactly like Greenham. Then Detective Clayton left this business card on the man's door with a note to phone him regarding something he called Lead 176. 176 is actually my academy class number, and it was just something to try to inject a little humor in the investigation. But it was no joke to James Greenham. When Greenham came home with the card on his door, he went into a panic. Greenham ran out, got in his truck, drove away, drove out in the desert, frantically tried to call Tim Rain. He left this urgent message. Yeah, we'll call 911, don't you can understand. You can call me. Hours later, a distraught Greenham, who was still out in the desert, finally got hold of Ring. They didn't take it at my house. Over what? I don't know. Is that right? He left his business card. Tom Clayton, senior investigator. The conversation went on like this for a while. Finally. I don't know what that would mean, but no, don't, there's nothing to sweat. Ring convinced Greenham to go home. The following day, Ring went to check up on Greenham at his apartment. Investigators had it bugged and listened in. To them, it appeared Ring was coaching Greenham in a cover story. Number one, you still remember the story about pulling me out of this, huh? Okay, number two, you can't just say, I was like a four feet pulling the thing out of this. So they had to walk up, you know, that's the right day. Ring, as always, spent the conversation trying to calm his friend down. Very uncomfortable something that big. But they thought you were involved, they'd crash your door. If they thought that you knew something, they, uh, they would not leave a car. They would come back and pull it down. To investigators, it was all evidence. Enough, they hoped, that they would soon be able to make an arrest. And investigators now sensed that suspected leader, Tim Ring, was nervous. Soon after, Ring left Detective Clayton a phone message to find out what he wanted. Hey, you left the card at my door and says, please call reference a case, refer to lead 176. Have no idea what it's about or what you're asking me, but you can call me back if you want. Later that same day, Ring finally reached the detective. I'm calling for Jim Greenham. I just want to let you know he's out of town. I take care of his place when he's gone. Greenham, I don't know the name. Was there a number on back of the card? Talking to Tim was the best sales job I could do. I was very nervous. I was trying not to let it come across in my voice and be kind of calm and collected and, and go into that law enforcement buddy mode that, hey, you're one of us. We're trying to catch up on leads. Somebody called in and said the person in that apartment looks like the composite and drives a red truck of some kind. Yeah, he just got his truck. <laughs> he bought, oh, he just got one? Yeah. Yeah, well, probably not likely that uh, he's been out doing any armed robberies or anything. <laughs> I've known him for a long time. I don't think so, but... <laughs> During their conversation, Ring told Clayton that he, too, was investigating the Wells Fargo heist. Just between you, me, and the wall, I'm working on that, too. I'm a CI for the FBI. CI means confidential informant. This was no surprise to investigators who knew Ring had done informant work with the Phoenix FBI office in the past and also knew that Ring had tried to exploit that relationship. Jim Ring came to us not long after the robbery and volunteered to work as a source to try to develop information as to who did the robbery. What we think he was doing was trying to come to us and find out what we knew. To the authorities, Ring's interest in the investigation was just one more sign of his involvement. We certainly had more information than they thought we had, and it, we were in control of the investigation at that point. They think they're not going to get caught, they're smug, they're self-confident, and in the back of my mind, I know we've got you. Finally, fearing that the group might catch on to the surveillance, or that they might try another heist, Almost three months after the robbery, authorities moved. They believed that Timothy Ring posed the most danger, 
and plan to arrest him first. We knew that Tim always carried a gun, or almost always carried one. So we tried to figure out the best place to take him without any chance of him uh, getting to his gun because he was also a competition shooter. He was an excellent shot. So we decided that we would uh, trick him into coming into the FBI office. They told Ring they needed assistance with the Wells Fargo investigation. The arrest was recorded on the office's security camera. I think Tim Ring was greatly surprised. I think he was astonished that this was happening to him and, and he just didn't really know how to react. And then, ah, oh, my arms, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, you can't have any weapons on you. No, I got a knife in my pocket. The other two men, Bill Ferguson and James Greenham, were arrested that same day at local stores. Ring and Ferguson refused to speak with police. However, James Greenham agreed to sit down to talk. To Detective Tom Clayton, he appeared ready to confess. I would describe Mr. Greenham as being somewhat defeated at that point. He knew he had been caught. Of the three individuals, it appeared he had the most conscience about what had happened. Greenham spoke little and cried throughout much of the two-hour-long interrogation. He's a sensitive person down there, and you know what? It's okay for a man to cry. It's okay for a man to be sensitive. Clayton worked every angle he could to get the man to open up. Tim is using you. You're Tim's little captive. Tim is going to send you down the river. Greenham's responses, however, were mostly inaudible. Tim laid it out, didn't he? Did Tim lay out the plan? Clayton kept at him. Are you willing to sit here and let someone point the finger at you for pulling the trigger? Finally, about an hour in, Greenham cracked. As we're talking, he's kind of talking in whispered tones or light tones. And finally, he just, he says, Tim did it. Tim pulled the trigger? I was kind of surprised that he just spit it out like that. Shortly after his declaration, Greenham led investigators through the full story of what he knew about the heist. Greenham told police that Ring had done all the planning, which meant following the van and scoping out the driver's routine. Then, on the appointed day, the three men waited for the white armored van to pull up in front of Dillard's. They watched as the driver opened his door to smoke a cigarette. The details were that Tim was parked a distance from the van. When the driver opened the door to smoke, that Tim Ring shot him with a silenced rifle. The design was to be for Greenham to be at the truck when the driver was shot, open the door, shove him over, and drive off so no one would see anything. Greenham said he then drove off in the white van followed closely by Ring's red pickup. They drove three miles across town, meeting again in the parking lot of a church. There they unloaded the van, transferred the money to Ring's truck, and drove out to the desert to cover their tracks. They burned the checks, all the wrappings, the clothes and shoes, everything that they had on uh, to destroy evidence. The Glendale Police Department found some burnt debris in the desert. Far more evidence was found in the suspects' homes. At Ring's house, they found several things that seemed to implicate him in the crime. Most importantly, a duffel bag full of money. Over $200,000 cash was found in a green bag in the garage with Tim Ring's name on it. There was a separate bag inside that with some cash with James Greenham's ID. Laid out, it was an impressive haul. $271,681 in cash. Police also found an arsenal of weapons, ammunition, and police gear, including a homemade silencer and a rifle. Authorities believe that Ring might have used this rifle to kill John Magash, the driver of the armored van. Among Ring's personal papers was a post-it note it showed three columns labeled F, Y, and T, with sums of money written underneath each letter. 
we surmised the TYNF was actually the amount of money each individual was to get for their part in the robbery. Uh, Tim stood for Tim Ring Y, Yoda, which was Jim Greenham's nickname, and F for Ferguson. The columns added up to $575,995, close to the $563,000 stolen from the van. Later that night, the men were transported to the Maricopa County Jail. James Greenham and Bill Ferguson stayed silent as they were led past reporters. But Tim Ring was only too happy to talk. At his arraignment a week and a half later, he insisted he was innocent. Tim, do you think you're being framed on this? I've got a lot of different ideas. What about the evidence of uh, the conversation? Sounds like they had a wiretap on you. They did have a wiretap, but they're just showing you neat little excerpts from the whole conversation. If you saw the whole thing, you'd have a different light on things. You're saying they got the wrong guy? I know they got the wrong guy. For Detective Tom Clayton, Ring's responses clearly supported his earlier impressions of the man. I described him, Ring, as having ice in his veins. After listening to him for two months on the telephone, you knew that he was very cold calculating and he wasn't going to admit anything. He's in it for Tim. Phoenix, November 1995. Timothy Ring's death penalty trial begins. The 31-year-old stood accused of planning with two accomplices the daylight heist of a Wells Fargo van and murdering the driver. Prosecutors planned to argue that Ring had pulled the trigger, but for Ring to be eligible for the death penalty, they didn't have to prove it. Under the charge felony murder, all that was required was proving that the murder happened during the course of the armed robbery and that Ring was a full participant. In opening arguments, prosecutor Alfred Fenzel asserted that a dogged investigation had cracked the case. During this trial, you learn how the relatively small local Glendale Police Department, with the help of the FBI, solved this case. Defense attorney Greg Clark retorted that it was the FBI, the so-called help, who in fact was the reason why they were all here. He promised to prove his client had been set up, set up because the FBI office in Phoenix had put Tim Ring on the payroll to commit illegal activities. Now, as part of what's going to happen by the defense, we're just going to call into the credibility of the FBI. We're going to directly confront that. Clark promised to demonstrate this with hard evidence but he would first have to overcome the circumstantial evidence prosecutors had on their side. Much of it had been found in Timothy Ring's home. The evidence included high-priced luxury items, like these all-terrain vehicles Ring had paid for in cash, a duffel bag with Ring's name on it, filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the post-it note the state said showed Ring divvying up the hall. On top of that, Prosecutors also had the surveillance tapes. I think the strongest pieces of evidence against Ring um, were his own statements on the wiretap tapes. Good evening. Among the surveillance introduced by the state was this conversation between Ring and Bill Ferguson. In it, Ring says he is cutting off James Greenham. They're doing so good too, but not anymore. I'm cutting them off. And then says this. Do you understand? I hold both of his and mine. Mm, I have it. He doesn't. Mm. Prosecutors said this conversation could only be referring to one thing. That ring was holding Greenham's cut from the heist. They backed it up by showing the jury a second bag full of money found in Ring's house. This one had Greenham's picture in it. The audio tapes got me to start leaning towards the possibility that Timothy Ring was guilty. Just in hearing some of the things that were said, how they were said, and, and so on, it's like that. The defense fought back, insisting that there were no fingerprints, no eyewitnesses, no direct evidence that linked Tim Ring to the crime. They found no evidence from the van that would tie the money that was seized in Mr. Ring's garage to the robbery. There was nothing there. 
Greg Clark instead directed the jury's attention to composite sketches made of possible suspects. He pointed out that none of the sketches which had come from witness recollections appeared to match Ring. Clark said there was a good reason for that. Mr. Ring's position was, and, and I believe still is, is he was essentially railroaded to some extent by the FBI in this case, by their deception. To try to prove this and to explain away all the other evidence, Clark decided that he had to put his client on the stand. They told him that, you know, this is going to come down to this. It's going to come down to your credibility, to, you know, some very hard questions that need to be answered that can't be answered in any other fashion. Ring was called to testify in the fourth week of the trial. His attorney started with the basics. Ring gave a short answer to the first important question about the murder of Wells Fargo driver John Magash. Hey, let me ask you this. Did you have any part in the demise of Mr. Magash? No. Ring seemed to have an answer for everything in the state's case. For the supposedly incriminating statements caught on surveillance, he claimed that his FBI handler had involved him in the heist early on as an investigator looking for the true culprits. There were initial discussions the day after the robbery. Who initiated those discussions? I believe he paged me and I returned the page. This ring claimed explained why he was talking about the heist on surveillance. For the post-it note, Exhibit 122, which the state alleged showed the three suspects divvying up money from the heist, Ring responded that in reality, it was a speculative business plan. He told the jury he and James Greenham were going to start a construction company together. It was actually one of the very first notes that Mr. Greenham and I had put together when we initially started about combining our resources. We just sat down and started crunching numbers. And this is one of well, over a dozen different ones that we had come up with. This is the one I kept because it was the first one I made. It was kind of like the ultimate goal. Under cross-examination, Ring kept a cool head as prosecutors questioned him about the three columns and what they meant. Uh, who's that? The well, that stands for front money. Mm -hmm. Well, that would have been the money after we had split the third of the make-believe investment. I mean, these are just numbers that we made up. I wasn't asking you what was going to be. I want to know the name of that. The F stands for front money. One of the most pressing things Timothy Ring needed to explain was where the duffel bag full of money found in his garage had come from. Ring told the jury it came from several sources. Some of the money he claimed was James Greenham's savings, which he was holding for his friend. But a good deal of it, he insisted, was his money. When questioned about where he got it, Ring made the stunning claim that he had earned it making covert bounty hunting trips to Mexico on behalf of the FBI. How many times did you uh, travel to Mexico uh, at the behest of the FBI? I made a total of six trips. What Ring was describing, trips across international borders to make arrests, was illegal, forbidden under international law. Ring claimed that for doing this dirty work and keeping it secret, the FBI paid handsomely. And the three individuals that I actually apprehended and brought back or arranged for a pickup in the United States was a total of about $105,000. Ring was saying that because the FBI did not want to admit to any of this, to cover its tracks, it was making him the fall guy for the heist. Earlier in the trial, FBI agents from the Phoenix office had testified that they did have a relationship with Ring as a bounty hunter. But they denied that Ring had run covert operations for them and said Ring had in fact approached them about working on the Wells Fargo heist. They also denied ever paying the man anywhere near the amounts he was alleging. How much money was paid by the FBI to Mr. Ring? $458. The defense could not produce any record of the $105,000 Ring alleged he had been paid. Ring claimed the files had been stolen from his house. 
The only evidence the defense produced of the conspiracy were Tim Ring's statements. State your name for the record, please. Timothy For two full days in his death penalty trial, Timothy Ring told his story. How he had nothing to do with killing a Wells Fargo driver and had not stolen half a million dollars. But the assertions he made explaining the critical questions in the state's case weren't corroborated by any other evidence. Mr. Ring had an answer for everything, but there was nothing that ever supported anything. He did more to damage himself than he did to help himself. He probably would have been better off not to have talked at all. On December 5th, 1996, Judge Gregory Martin sent the case to the jury. Juror Kevin Feltner says they considered the defense conspiracy argument, but in the end could not buy into it. There was nothing that the defense ever brought up that could give you something to get a hold of to say it's possible. So after five hours of deliberation, jurors announced their verdict. They found Tim Ring guilty of felony murder. That meant they believed Ring had been deeply involved in the crime, but could not decide whether Ring himself had shot the driver. With the information that we were given, um, I still don't have any doubts that Timothy Ring was guilty. Um, but I can also say that I, I don't know if Timothy Ring pulled the trigger. Even so, the verdict made Ring eligible for a death sentence. According to Arizona law at the time, Ring's sentence would be decided not by the jury, but by trial judge Gregory Martin. In October 1997, Judge Martin heard testimony. One of the witnesses for the state was alleged co-conspirator James Greenham, who had confessed to police to participating in the crime, but had not testified at Ring's trial. Greenham told the judge Tim Ring had planned the heist, and that Ring had pulled the trigger, and even wanted to be congratulated on his shot afterwards. Defense attorney Greg Clark thought Greenham's testimony had been bought. It was awful to sit there to listen to Mr. Greenham. It was awful because I had known from speaking to Mr. Greenham uh, that essentially he's a snake and he would say and do whatever he thought he needed to say or do in an effort to save his life. On October 29th, 1997, Ring's 33rd birthday, Judge Martin handed down his decision. He found, based in substantial part on Greenham's testimony, that Ring had acted in a, quote, heinous and depraved manner, and that he had both shot and killed the driver, John Magash. It is the judgment and sentence of the court for the defendant, Timothy Stewart Ring, be sentenced to death. Speaking to reporters afterwards, Ring seemed unfazed. I wasn't surprised. As a matter of fact, I had a friendly bet with my lawyer. I won. He still insisted he was innocent, and even made a plea to his victim's daughter. I did not shoot your father. I may know who did it, if the information I have is correct. I would like to help you or, or see these people brought to justice. While Ring has never made good on that claim, his case was far from over. The reason why, according to his appellate attorney, John Stuckey, was that James Greenham's testimony at sentencing had raised a fundamental question of fairness for Tim Ring. Greenham's testimony was the basis upon which he got the death penalty. Immediately from when I heard about this case, it struck me as a strange situation that the jury never heard all of the evidence that supposedly made him the shooter. It was only a judge that heard that. The problem, the attorney says, is that the Bill of Rights guarantees every American the right to a trial by jury and makes the jury the sole fact finder in the case. It's for this reason that in April 2002, the case of Timothy Stewart Ring versus the state of Arizona was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court. Our argument was that it is unconstitutional for Arizona to have a jury find you guilty of first-degree murder, go home, and then ask the judge to find the aggravating circumstances that would qualify you for death. Those aggravators ought to have to be found by a jury as well. 
In June 2002, the Supreme Court issued its precedent-setting decision. It overturned Ring's sentence, saying that juries, not judges, must make all decisions of fact in death penalty cases. This caused several states to change their death penalty laws. But it also impacted the fates of those convicted under the old system. In September 2003, a federal appeals court ruled that more than 100 death sentences in Arizona and two other states should be commuted to life. This decision did not affect Ring's fate. Ring was allowed to speak to us by phone back in February 2003. He talked about the Supreme Court ruling that bore his name. This is simply the, the U.S. Supreme Court looking at the corrupt acts of one judge and deciding to use it as the example to change the law in Arizona and the other states that use the same law. While he was pleased with the ruling, Ring says his most important appeal is to come. For that, he promises to reveal all the evidence of his innocence, much of which he claims was hidden from the jury. What they've done is that they've admitted to having over a thousand phone calls on tape, and they only presented a few. And then they uh, presented some conversations to intentionally mislead the jury. But they twisted it and just put on a big show. What we're talking about here is what's the right sentence for Tim Ring. And of course, Every part of Tim's being is focused upon the fact, not what his sentence ought to be, that, but that he's innocent. And therefore, what he needs and wants from his perspective is ultimately a new trial where he can prove his ultimate innocence. Those who worked so hard to arrest Rig and put him away hope he never gets that chance at a new trial. I have absolutely no doubt that Mr. Ring is the leader of this group. I have no doubt in my mind that he's the one that pulled the trigger. And I have no doubt in my mind that he should be executed for that crime. Third glasses of John Magash. The perpetrators had left no fingerprints in the van. And the ballistic evidence turned out to be of little use. There was very little recovered as far as a bullet. We found out that was because a frangible bullet was used, which is a bullet that will break up whenever it uh, is shot and makes entry into uh, whatever it hits. The likelihood of solving any crime drops as the hours go by. For the heist, police had no leads after 24 hours, and the pressure was on. A lot of people wanted this to be solved. You don't get a whole lot of, uh, of armored cars that uh, get taken down, especially where the driver is murdered. The mysterious case was left to lead detective Tom Clayton, 12-year veteran of the Glendale Police Department. With so little to go on, Clayton sent out alerts to see if the public could offer any help. Police fielded a few calls from people who reported seeing a white man leaving the mall. One call we received was from a gentleman in Sun City. He noted a white van driving down the road at a high rate of speed. It was being followed very closely by a red truck, and it, it ran a stop sign. The witness recalled that the truck was driven by a dark-haired white male in his 20s or 30s, but he could not remember the make of the vehicle. Investigators who were grasping at straws tried to jog the witness's memory with photos of red pickups. But he couldn't narrow it down any further. Authorities couldn't find the truck, and the investigation ground to a halt. Then, a month later in December, police received the tip they'd been looking for. An informant told Pups the driver stays with the van at all times. Both messenger and driver carry 38 caliber pistols. If the doors are forced open, an alarm sounds. In this case, however, all of those security measures had failed. To find the culprits, investigators started with the two Wells Fargo employees. My first thought, as most of our first thoughts were, is perhaps the driver or perhaps the messenger might be involved because many times in armored car robberies there is an insider involved in the planning or the execution of the robbery. However, that idea was quickly dismissed. Investigator Bruce Lowe had questioned the messenger right after the van went missing. He was big, doe-eyed, uh, frightened kind of uh, befuddled, if you will, and it was hard to uh, uh, 
create anything to say that he was involved in this. As for the murdered driver, John Magash, if he had been involved, he had been double-crossed. But Lowe learned Magash had a clean record at Wells Fargo. He also had a habit that might just explain what had happened. It was a normal thing for Mr. Magash to smoke, and he wasn't actually supposed to be doing that because he had to open the door to do that. Sometimes he would step out, but most of the time he would sit in the van and actually smoke uh, the, the cigarette inside the van, just blowing it out the door. This breach of security explained how a robber could gain entry to the armored van without setting off the alarm. The robbers seemed to have made a clean getaway. They were smart enough to have known the habits of the driver and had left few clues behind. Police had scoured the mall, and all they found were the shattered... ...car is a particularly bold crime. It was the perfect heist. No fingerprints, no eyewitnesses, nothing. This is a story to show that pride goes before a fall. The more they know, the less they know. We're still sitting pretty. They think they're not going to get caught, and in the back of my mind, I know we've got... You know Tim Ring was greatly surprised. The van was running. That's what the man at the church had said. An armored white van, with its motor running, abandoned in the parking lot. Police, when they arrived, could see a body in the front seat. They feared the worst. Eleven hours earlier, 8 a.m., November 28, 1994. Phoenix, Arizona. Wells Fargo driver John Magash and his messenger started their daily rounds. In an unmarked armored van, they went from business to business, picking up the cash that was brought in each day to deliver it to the bank. On the radio at headquarters was John Magash's friend, Harold Hart. He says nothing about that morning seemed out of the ordinary. Magash was in his usual humor. He always done this Humphrey Bogart thing my last name's Hart. Call him police about a woman who might have information regarding the crime. Detectives Clayton and Lowe tracked down the woman and questioned her. In her first interview, she told us about a boyfriend named James Greenham who had been living with her that had made a comment one time about uh, what would you do if I robbed an armored car? The man, it turned out, sometimes worked as a bouncer. But James Greenham was usually broke until his ex-girlfriend said about a month ago when something had changed sometime after the armored car robbery she described mr greenham coming up with uh quite a bit of cash and paying paying bills and, and having money to spend the ex-girlfriend told the investigators that greenham had a friend named tim ring ring was also a bounty hunter and she believed he too could have been involved in the heist this was the break Detective Clayton desperately needed. He now had two prime suspects, but the men would not be easy to catch. FBI Special Agent Ron Myers says that as members of the sometimes shadowy world of bounty hunters, the two suspects had an edge. They knew a lot of things that we would do, a lot of investigative techniques we would use, and we had to be cautious that they didn't catch us using them. And so an elaborate cat and mouse game began, one that would soon grow to include 70 investigators working around the clock, all trying to get back a missing half million dollars and get justice for a murdered driver. Just outside Phoenix, Arizona, November 1994. An armored Wells Fargo van is robbed of over half... On the radio, I'd call him, Hey, John, what are you doing? He'd say, I'm just sitting here, sweetheart. 
Then, around 1.30 p.m., the armored van pulled up to the Arrowhead Mall in suburban Glendale. By this time, it was carrying over half a million dollars. It stopped in front of Dillard's department store. The messenger exited the van and went inside. He made his pickup, then came back five minutes later to... Nothing. The van, the money, and the driver were gone. Five hours later, the van was finally located. Police had to wait for a Wells Fargo representative to arrive because the van's alarm was still activated. When the door was opened, inside was the dead body of the missing driver, John Magash. Mr. Magash had a gunshot wound to the uh, temple. He was lying down on the floorboard, completely dressed in his uh, security uniform. What was most personal to me was just how cold-blooded and senseless it was. You can take down an armored car, you can, you can give money from someone and not have to kill them. The back of the van was empty, save for some rolled coins and reports. The half a million dollars had been stolen. From the beginning, police knew they were dealing with sophisticated criminals who had foiled a tried-and-true security system. At companies like Wells Fargo, vans are armor-plated, the glass bullet-resistant. They employ a buddy system that is difficult to beat. The messenger, or hopper, makes all deliveries and pickups.